Buongiorno tutti quanti. Hello everybody. Welcome to Sunrise Semester. I'm your instructor, Marcello Sebastiano. The topic of today's program is communicating in Italian. We will discuss the fantastic vocabulary range of the Italian Ainz. I'm going to show some end gestures that you will see all the time, sometimes in an Italian conversation. The first one is achieved by taking the right hand, palm up, and cupping the fingers like this. This could mean several things. For example, Hey, what are you doing with my wife? Or, I think you need some more garlic. Or, are you crazy or something? If this were a regular part of a conversation, one could reply by shrugging the shoulders and raising the hands up like this. Which could mean, I didn't know it was your wife. Yoshi, you dinner devouring dino brat. Leave some for the rest of us. Oh, sure we. Just for that, my ravenous reptile, you can go see Mama Fireplant and bring back some fireballs to start the barbecue. Oh, Kakamba, Mama Fireplant lives on the other side of the river. Something's happening. I don't know what it is, but I can feel it. Have you noticed anything? I have. I want to help you, but you have to talk to me. My husband is not my husband. He was articulate, he was intelligent, not obviously psychotic or emotionally disturbed. Uh, he could read a newspaper. Everything seemed fine, except he had one profound delusion. He would look at his mother and he would say, this woman, doctor, she looks exactly like my mother. But in fact, she's not my mother. She's an imposter. She's some other woman pretending to be my mother. David was also convinced that his father was an imposter. He would say to his dad, you know, I'm sure you would like to meet this guy. He's so much like you, but he drives better. He doesn't go so fast. It can look identical to him. Exactly like him, but it's not him. After two months of this disturbing behavior, David's parents decided to seek help from Ramachandran. Yeah, that's wonderful. But when you looked at your, the person who looked like your father, what was your feeling? Does it, did it look like there's some other person who resembles your father? Is not really your father, something like that? Did exactly. It, there's a difference that the fact that I know that that person happens not to be my father. Uh-huh. It is not my father or my mother, right? Okay. I don't expect things from that person as I would expect from my parents. No. They I got to call the teacher today. David not only had delusions about people, he also believed that the house that he lived in was just an imitation of his home. One day he started getting really angry. I want to go to my house. I want to go to David's house. I want to go to David's house. And we're in the apartment. And I'm just going, what am I going to do? So I decided, I said, okay, David, let's go. So I took him down the stairs. And I went around through the back, came back through the elevator, took him to bring, you know, the same apartment. And I said, this is your house. And I opened the door and I said, okay, ciao. And I just left him there alone. It was the same apartment. And he looked at it and said, oh, yes, this is my apartment. Things like that would happen. Right. And, and then maybe a few days after, he would start the same. I want to go to my house. David's house. This is not David's house. Amazingly, David sometimes referred to himself as the other David as if his own self were an imposter. The Capgras delusion has been known since the turn of the century, but has been treated as a curiosity and a normal.
solid. Come on, let's go. We also practice phasing, crossing from particle to wave, from physical to energy. Solid objects seem to, to pass right through you. That starts with a breathing exercise. You go, and then you think black. That's a nothingness. Got it? It's... We don't know in quantum mechanics how to hook ourselves as observers up with the world. We don't know how to treat ourselves as observers as just another part of the physical system that we're describing. The only way we know how to do quantum mechanics as it's traditionally formulated is to keep the observer outside of the system you're describing. Um, the minute you put him in, you get all these paradoxes. And we're forced to say things in quantum mechanics like, look, the book is doing what it's doing because of quantum mechanics, and I see that because I'm there and I see it, and you better not try to analyze that second part of the sentence in terms of applying quantum mechanics to it because it's going to break down. That's why there are these two separate laws of the evolutions of physical systems. One that applies when you're not looking at them, the other that applies when you are. But that's crazy. There's no way that we're ever going to mathematize or put into mathematical formula this very act in which a conscious observer comes up with the answer. People say, oh, the measuring instruments, the recorder records it and there it is, it's on the tape, it's recorded. You forgot one part of the equation. Somebody has to look at the tape. And until somebody looks at the tape, it ain't recorded at all. When you are not looking, there are waves of possibility. When you are looking, then there are particles of experience. A particle, which we think of as a solid thing, really exists in a so-called superposition, a spread out wave of possible locations. And it's in all of those at once. The instant you check on it, it snaps into just one of those possible positions. Invisibility. Invisibility? Yeah. That was level three. Like, actual invisibility? Yeah, that was the goal. Eventually we adapted it to just finding a way of not being seen. But once you understand the linkage between observation and reality, then you begin to dance with invisibility. Well, the way our brain is wired up, we only see what we believe is possible. Um, we match patterns that already uh, exist within ourselves through conditioning. So, uh, a wonderful story that I believe is true is that when the Indians, the Native American Indians uh, on the Caribbean islands saw Columbus's ships approaching, they couldn't see them at all because it was so unlike anything they had ever seen before, they couldn't see it. When Columbus's armada landed in the Caribbean, none of the natives were able to see the ships, even though they existed on the horizon. The reason that they never saw the ships was because they had no knowledge in their brains or no experience that clipper ships existed. So the shaman starts to notice that there's ripples out in the ocean, but he sees no ship, but he starts to wonder what's causing the effect. So every day he goes out and looks and looks and looks and after a period of time he's able to see the ships. And once he sees the ships, he tells everybody else that ships exist out there because everybody trusted and believed in him. They saw them also.